Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Harris, for that kind introduction. And, uh, Hillary Binda, my friend from college, and now my, my uh, we've reconnected um, around this set of issues. And, and, and my, so my new colleague, um, uh, Professor Weinberg, and Professor Rubin, I appreciate you all inviting me and the kind of leadership that you're showing on these issues. And I want to put a special welcome to uh, the inside students, those of you that are, are watching on videotape. Um, I appreciate you watching this. And I look forward to having the chance to meet you uh, one day uh, on the outside. I thought that I would, would start of my talk by talking about my motivations for writing this book, Locking Up Our Own. And the first motivation for me has nothing to do with the criminal system. I'm the kind of person, I don't know if there's anybody else out here like this, but I'm the kind of person that if I go to a film and there's no African-American characters in the film, and then the movie's over, somebody says, well, what did you think about the film? I'm always a little mad, and I always start with, well, you know, where were the black characters? Where was that representation? And I feel that way about film. I feel that way about television. I feel that way about novels, literature. I feel that way about history, and I feel that way about law. So I knew that when I wrote my first book, I was going to write a book that had African-American characters front and central in the narrative. I was going to try to show rich intellectual, political, social, cultural debates within the African-American community. So it wasn't going to be, you know, that, that, that movie or that television show where there's the, the black character shows up as the best friend and then they're killed at the end of the first act and they never come back again. This was going to be a book that was full of African-American characters. And the second motivation that I had was all about the criminal system. There are a lot of stories. There's, there's history and argument, but, but fundamentally, it's a book of stories. And, and one of the stories in the book is of a young man by the name of Brandon. It's an in introduction. Some of y'all I know have read it. And Brandon had pled guilty to possession of a gun and possession of a small amount of marijuana, $15, $20 worth. And he was facing sentencing. I was his public defender. I had been appointed to represent him. And I had taken the job because I viewed it as the civil rights issue of my generation. As your provost said, I grew up with parents who were in the original civil rights movement. My dad was the executive secretary of SNCC. My mom was a member of that organization. And they're an interracial couple. My dad's black, my mom's white. They're an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And their generation changed America. Theirs was the generation that faced down Bull Connor's dogs that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They came to D.C., 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And they made it possible for me to have this bio, to clerk on the Supreme Court, to have opportunities that were not imaginable to a black man of my father's generation. And yet, at the same time, I could see how much work was left to be done in the movement. Because even though I had some of those opportunities, it was also true, and we knew this by the early 90s, that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. And in that same report from the Sentencing Project, they also reported, although it got less attention, that black women were the largest single growing portion of the prison population. We already knew that the United States, having passed Russia and South Africa to become the world's largest jailer, was 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisons. 
And I had seen it in my own life. I grew up in a neighborhood in Atlanta, working class, lower middle class, mostly African American neighborhood. There were two huge buildings in my neighborhood when I was a kid. Atlanta Federal Penitentiary and a General Motors plant. By the time I graduated from law school and was deciding what to do with my life, one of those buildings had shut down and the other had built an addition. And I don't even need to tell you which is which. So I had seen with my own eyes classmates in my high school getting pulled into that criminal system. So I decided to become a public defender. That brought me to be representing Brandon. And I was asking for him to be put on probation. I had a letter from teach, a teacher and a counselor at his school. It was his first arrest. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They were just like the way the court is. is bench here and the prosecutor's there, the judge is there. They were about this far away. And they had been there for every court hearing. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor was asking for him to be locked up. She wanted him to go to Oak Hill, D.C.'s juvenile prison, juvenile facility. Whatever the official name for it, the reality was that it was a dungeon. No functioning school, no job training programs worth the name. You know, if you went downtown, a piece of paper, they'd say, oh, we have this program and that program. But if you went there, you saw that it wasn't happening. That's why you'll have to go there. That's why this prison initiative is so exciting. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Because it's going to teach you what's actually happening, not what people say is happening. The judge that had to make the decision, Judge Curtis Walker, and I should say I changed the names of everybody in the, any of the court proceedings, I changed the names. Not to protect the privacy of the judge, to protect the privacy of my client. I didn't want anybody to be able to figure out who these cases were about. Judge Walker looks out at the court, and so he sees a young black man facing sentencing. He sees an African-American defense attorney and a black prosecutor. The judge himself is African-American. None of this is especially unusual in D.C. court. And the judge has to hand down his decision, and he looks into Brandon, and he says, Son, Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life, that you deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough, son. Let me tell you about Jim Crow. The judge had been a child in those years. He proceeded to lecture Brandon on that, what that was like. And then he wrapped up and he said, so here's the thing, son. People fought, marched, and died for you to be free. Dr. King died for you to be free. And I'll tell you this. He didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your family and embarrassing your community. No, that was not his dream at all. So I hope you turn it around. I hope Mr. Foreman is right. But right now, actions have consequences, and your consequence is Oak Hill. He locked him up. And I, that day, ever since that day, you know, I went back and saw Brandon in the cell block. There were three other teenage African-American boys, young men in there with him. I thought about his mother and grandmother crying in the hallway. They almost certainly were. And I really began to reflect on the fact that there was a story that needed to be told that had not yet been written. A story of how it was that over the last 50 years, as America embarked on a prison building project, the likes of which the world has never seen, how it was that so many in my own community, so many in the African American community, went along for the ride, became persuaded in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s that these policies made sense. See, because I was upset with the judge, right? He had flipped the history of the civil rights movement. The same thing that gave me the motivation to be in court, he had flipped it and used it as a justification to lock up my client. But he wasn't alone. 40% of the judges in D.C. are African American. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was being sentenced under was a majority black city council. The police chief was black. The police force was and is majority black. The chief prosecutor was none other than Eric Holder. 
So what was going on? With all that, you know, I told you one in three young black men under criminal justice supervision nationally in D.C. It was one in two. So I wanted to write a book to try to figure out what was going on. By the way, for those of y'all that are, you know, I mean, mostly this audience is mostly students. As you think of, for those of you that decide to write papers, write dissertations, thesis, a problem that you cannot understand and you want to figure out what's going on, that's a great way to start a project. So I'm tempted to say, you know, we have some some books. A bunch of y'all have bought the book, so you already know the answers. And those of you that haven't, we have some for sale. We could pause here and do like, you know, my son is eight. They have sustained silent reading. Read the book and have a conversation about it. But figuring y'all came out to probably get some of the highlights of the argument. So let me mention a couple of those. The first thing to understand how this happened is to grapple with rising crime and violence in this country, but in black communities especially, in the 1960s and in the 1980s. My students, I don't know, I don't know if, just out of curiosity, uh, who's watched some or all of The Wire? Okay, it's still a thing, but less and less of a thing. So when I talk to my students, those of whom know, watch The Wire, that's what they think of when they think of drug violence, the crack years represented in that show. But in the 1960s, heroin in black communities was the crack even before there was crack. Nationally, the homicide rate doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in Washington, D.C. It doubled in Boston. Heroin devastated black neighborhoods around the country. They tested everybody that entering the D.C. jail for drugs every year in the 60s. 1963, they concluded that 3% were heroin addicts. By 1969, that 3% had become 45%. That's an epidemic. But it wasn't just the numbers, it was also the fear and the anguish that they generated. One of the things that I did was I went and looked at archives of papers of city council members and other black elected officials that have retired, donated their papers to local libraries. I'm sorry to report to y'all, by the way, that there's no keyword searching, nothing is scanned, it's all open up a file, pick out the paper, read the paper, but if you do that for summer after summer, you will see decades of letters from black citizens. These are mostly African American citizens, DC was 70% black in the 70s, to mostly African American elected officials. And what they're saying is, we're scared. We feel like prisoners in our own home. We feel like strangers on our streets. We don't know what's happened to us as a community. We can't take our kids to school because they're selling drugs on the corner. We can't leave them in the park after school because they're shooting. And over and over again, they're saying, ending these letters with some form of do something, do something, you have to do something about it. Now, who's receiving these letters? The people that are receiving these letters, this is the second big argument in the book, they're the first generation of black elected officials to come into office after the decline of formal Jim Crow, after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, In the 1970s, there's an 800% increase nationally in the 1970s of African-American elected officials. This is a generation of people, many of them from the South, some of them in the Civil Rights Movement, all of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law in black communities. My dad used to tell me about this. Even before I started researching the book, and then the, backed it up, the research backed it up, he talked about how you didn't call the police, and he grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, and, and de facto Jim Crow, Chicago. So you didn't call the police in black neighborhoods. The police weren't going to come. And if they did come, they were guaranteed to make things worse. So they 
Remember this history. Now they're in office as elected officials, and they are bound and determined to make the law, to make government, to make police work and responsive to black communities, those letter writers that are saying, do something. OK, they're motivated to do something. The demand from the citizens is to do something. But why is the something they do police and prosecutors? Why that? And here is the third big argument of the book. Because I said up front that I wanted to write a book about African American characters, right? But when you're 12% of the population and a historically oppressed 12% at that, any book that's about black political life, black intellectual life, is also has to be a book about the larger society, right? the larger structures that constrain and limit the choices that are available to the black community and the black elected officials. So what are some of those constraints? The first constraint is historical. The people that I'm writing about, black citizens, black elected officials, right? Black elected officials have been elected to represent communities and neighborhoods that have been disenfranchised, have been segregated, have been redlined, have had the wealth stripped out of them, have been foreclosed have in urban renewal in the 1950s and 1960s had robust neighborhoods destroyed and highways put right down through the middle of black middle class neighborhoods like in Atlanta where I grew up, Auburn Avenue. It used to be called the Black Wall Street, destroyed by federal highways. Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, I recommend it on this history for those that haven't looked at it. It's a new book. The other constraint is political. The people that I'm writing about are local elected officials, and a big part of my argument is that local government, local politics matters for how we got into this mess and how we're going to get out of it. But there's also limitations to what local officials can do. Right? African American political power is concentrated in cities in mayor's offices, in city councils, sometimes in county councils. And what you see over and over again is these elected officials adopting what I call an all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They say, we want more police and more prosecutors. We want more law enforcement. But we also want more funding for schools, more funding for job training programs, a fight against segregation, a fight against racism, we want national gun control. We want a Marshall Plan for urban America. We want the United States government to do for black communities what it did for Europe after World War II, to rebuild, to reinvest, to revitalize. They went to Congress making those requests. But their calls fell on deaf ears. So black citizens and elected officials had this all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. But instead of all of the above, they got one of the above. And the one of the above they got from the national government was law enforcement. There's one more constraint that I want to mention, last constraint, because it's a constraint that I think continues to limit us to this day. We had a little chance to talk about it yesterday for those that were uh, in, uh, in Professor Weinberg, Professor Binda's classes. And this is constraint of imagination. There's a lot of examples of in this in the book, but let me me mention one. David Clark is one of the key figures in the book. He's city council member, Washington, D.C. In 1975, D.C. gets home rule, gets first locally elected city council with the power to pass criminal law. David Clark is that that city council had 11 of 13 members black. David Clark is one of the two white members. He had a very unusual biography. For a, white, for a white guy. He went to Howard Law School. He worked with Martin Luther King, became a lawyer for poor people, runs for city council, wins. He's not a drug warrior. The first thing he pushes for when he gets on the city council in 1975 is, drug, is marijuana decriminalization. He loses the battle, but he fights it. Fights a good fight. I think it's a good fight. Now, fast forward six years later, early 80s, he's the chair of the city council. Heroin, which had kind of stepped back for the 70s, comes back into force. 
all of a sudden the letter writers are starting again saying there's addicts, and this language of the letters, I don't endorse it. There's junkies nodding off on my stoop on the corner, gathering in the backyard, leaving their dirty syringes. You've got to do something about it. So what does Dave Clark do when he gets these letters? He sends a pretty responsible official. He sends them to a local, head of the local relevant government agency. He then gets a letter back. Councilmember Clark, I've received your citizen complaint. We're on the case. And Clark then takes that packet of uh, letters and sends them to the citizen. Now, I, don't know, I don't know if any of y'all write, like, you know, your local officials, but I do, and I've never get, I get like a best at auto reply. This is good constituent services. But the problem is this. What is the agency that Dave Clark forwards the letters to? A Department of Mental Health? Addiction Services? Social Work Counseling? No. Police Chief. Because even a non-drug warrior like David Clark, he's an American and he's his imagination is constrained, and like so many of us, he hears addict in public space, citizen complaint, and he thinks the response should be from the police. So that's the, that's the argument, the kind of highlights of the argument. I want to spend a few minutes now, the last sort of portion of this conversation, talking about what we should do in response. Because I think especially, especially for students, y'all are thinking about appropriately the world that you're going to try to create. So I want to talk about a little bit about what I think some of the lessons of this, of my research are for that. Um, and one, I guess, kind of framing or conceptual kind of way of thinking about it is that, you know, it's tempting to think of this problem of mass incarceration, 2.2 million people in prison, 7 million under criminal justice supervision. We don't even know how many million trying to go through this world with felony and misdemeanor convictions, facing the stigma that that entails. And it's tempting to try to identify a moment, a person, a historical figure, a president, an executive action, a piece of legislation, and say that was the, that's what caused. But the truth, I think, is messier, more complicated, different. The truth, I think, is that the way this problem got built was that over 50 years, across 50 states, the federal government, Washington, D.C., 3,000 counties, across a system that's not even a system, because the police don't talk, barely talk to the prosecutors, or barely talk to the judges, who don't coordinate with the legislators, who barely talk to probation and parole. So across this non-system of disaggregated, discrete actors, if everybody joins in, and then civil society, universities, I'm going to get to universities, civil society joins in, and everybody becomes harsher, everyone becomes less forgiving, everyone becomes less merciful, if we all do that collectively, then nobody individually actually has to move that much. And that's what I think when you see, when, you t when, I, when I talk to judges and prosecutors, they're quick to blame somebody else in the system. Well, they're responsible. They're responsible. People don't even recognize their own culpability, in part because people have gotten, let's say, 10, 15, 20, 25 percent harsher. And they've gotten there in a series of small steps. They don't even notice over time the choices that they've begun to make and the way they contribute to this human rights crisis. So it's a, if it, it's a problem of small steps, it's also going to be a series of small steps that unwinds it. The other lesson, I think, from this history is that although it's tempting and it's reassuring, and I really get the impulse, to try to define this as somebody else's problem. Someone else made this problem. They did it. A them problem. They got to solve it. 
The truth is, I think, that this is an us problem. I think that as a society, collectively, we are complicit, some more actively, yes, than others, but some tacitly, some turning away, some not wanting to look. That means the responsibility to fix it is going to be on all of us as well. That's one of the reasons why I was so dismayed. I wrote an op-ed earlier this week, some of y'all may have seen, in the New York Times in response to this case of this woman, uh, Michelle Jones, who was incarcerated, very serious, very serious crime, served 20 years, was paroled, was admitted to a bunch of graduate schools, was chosen for admission by the history department at Harvard. And her admission was overridden by top administrators at the university on the grounds of her record and what would it look like. And one of the reasons why I find that case emblematic is that the people that were involved in making that decision, I don't know them, but if they were like 98% of the people that I meet on a campus of a Harvard or a Yale or a Tufts, they think mass incarceration is a problem. They think it's unjust. Heck, some of them read the new Jim Crow. Brian Stevenson is a hero to them. But they don't see it as their responsibility to do something about it. They want somebody else to fix the problem. And what I'm saying is we cannot wait for somebody else. So what does that mean? That means that all of us, in our domains of control, in our spheres of influence, we have to look at, and we can, I'm all, you know, we should criticize people out there, and I'm all for piling on Jeff Sessions, and I'm, I'm with that. But, but when we finish tweeting about Sessions, we need to stop and say, okay, but what's within my domain of control right now? What's within my sphere of influence? How can I make a contribution today? So let's talk about universities. Universities, students and faculty, administrators, are well positioned to try to make a contribution in a, in a few different ways. First of all, let's just talk about you know, employment. What's your university's policy on hiring people with criminal records? If you don't know, find out. Let me talk to you about employment. The, the Ford Foundation is amazing work on criminal justice reform. Path-breaking work around the world. They did a presentation at a, at a university in, in New, at, a, at a prison in New York State. And after they presented all their work, one of the guys there who was incarcerated raised his hand and he said, thank you for that presentation. I just have one question. When I get out, could I get hired at the Ford Foundation? They didn't know. But to their credit, to their credit, right, domain of control, sphere of influence, they went back, they scrubbed their HR policies from top to bottom, they get right, got rid of 90% of the exclusions. But, but you have to go further, and they did, than ban the box. I'm all for ban the box, but ban the box is like step one out of ten. Because we have so stigmatized and so demoralized people, so ostracized people with criminal records, that so many people that I know and, that, and I work with, they don't even believe they can get jobs that they could get. If you want a dispiriting, demoralized experience and you don't have a criminal record, go on a job hunt with somebody who does. I've done it more times than I can count. And the stigma of having the door shut in your face, the look that you see on the person's face when you check, check a box that you have a record, the quick will be back in touch knowing they won't. 
So what we have to do is go further, and I give the Ford Foundation credit for this, and you can look at their lead. They set up a paid internship program where they hire people with good benefits and a pathway to a full-time position, and they explicitly advertise it as for people, including for people with criminal records. They, you explicitly put the message out to people that we are looking and we will consider you in your home. It's not a guarantee of a job. No guarantee, but we will consider you as more than simply a conviction. Okay, that's employment, but fundamentally universities are about education. So let me just mention a word or two on that. I think that right now with this prison project and this prison institute, prison initiative, two pit. Tuppet, I'm struggling with the, I'm struggling, I'm struggling with Tuppet. I'm not gonna lie, I'm struggling with Tuppet, but, but, no, I mean the whole thing. I, you gotta get, did you get students on that one? You gotta get the students, you gotta get the students on it, because the students will come up with one that they'll use. If you, it, you know what? It's almost, it's almost like. It's almost worse. This is the problem with us old people. It's like we should just stay in our old lane and then let the students figure out how to like freshen it up. Because, all right, okay, enough about that. Tupit. Did I get it right? No. Tuppet. Tuppet. Okay, I love Tuppet. And right now, I want everybody, if those of you that have a journal, make a little, make a note for the today's date. Put it in your electronic calendar if you want. Because I think that you, this as a community, a year, two, five years from now, you're going to look back at this first convening. And you're going to look back at this semester. And you are going to identify this semester, this gathering, as a time when you launch something that was transformative. Transformative in your lives and transformative in the lives of the university and transformative in the lives of incarcerated men and women that are going to be able to benefit from this program. Because everything we know, right, all the research says that there's society-wide benefits to education. Right? We ripped the Pell Grants out in the 90s. We ripped prison libraries out. We ripped schools out. We, university programs left when they couldn't get any more federal funding. But all the research says that there's four to five dollars worth of payback to society for every dollar that we invest in education for people behind bars. Even that case, uh, Bill Keller, the, one of the founders of the Marshall Project, wrote a story in which he estimated the education of Michelle Jones is saving society a million dollars. A million dollars because of the fact that she got her college degree inside before, again, Indiana ripped out the programs, meant that she then could be eligible for release after 20 years instead of after 50 years. So that's 30 years of prison saving. And then you have the fact that now coming out, she has a college degree. We can estimate the lifetime impact of a college degree on somebody's earnings. Now she's going to get a graduate degree. We can ask you, estimate that. And none of that would have been possible without prison, in, without college and prison. But for me, I mean, it's an economic issue. But ultimately, for me, it's a moral issue. And when I think about, I've seen it, the kind of education behind bars that I'm familiar with is the Inside Out program. And I know that's a piece of what you'll be doing here, not the full thing. But I'll just tell you my own impressions on, on that. I teach this class called Race, Class, and Punishment. I've taught it for years at Yale Law School. And I've been going around the country talking about what we can do in response to this problem, you know, lecturing university administrators, what, what should they do, employers, what should they do, churches, what synagogues, what should they do. I apologize for having this event on Rosh Hashanah. And I started thinking about what more could I do, right? My domain 
of influence, my sphere of control. And a lot of what I do is I teach. And I teach some of the most privileged students in the world. And I thought, that's meaningful, but it could get more meaningful. And I got trained in this Inside Out program, which tra trains university professors of every discipline. I happen to do law, criminal justice, but don't be fooled. Most of, you know, art, history, literature, philosophy, math, you, architecture, you name it, are offered. And I went to the Connecticut Department of Corrections to offer the class there. They said okay. And now I teach the class in the Connecticut prison to 10 men who are incarcerated and to 10 law students. And I always tell my colleagues in the law school, don't do this for self-interested reasons. But it is true that the best teaching evaluations I've ever gotten <laughs> were from that class. And the two most meaningful evaluations were from the inside students, the incarcerated students. And one of them wrote, at the end of the semester, he wrote, I appreciate the law and the policy that we learn. But really what I appreciate most of all is that when I came to class and I entered the seminar circle every week, I was treated like I had something to say. And I was treated like I was smart. And I was treated like I was an intellectual. And that goes against everything that I have experienced in my life educationally, and it goes against how the prison is set up to treat me. And you know, I think about, I, I, I think about his, his evaluation all the time. You know, and I think about, there's a lot, of course, that separates the inside students from the outside students. I want, don't want to minimize the structural barriers. But one thing that separates you and my students the outside students that I teach, is that you were in educational environments where you were treated like you were smart. That was just an assumed state of affairs. I mean, my son, a Mecca, I have an eight-year-old son. I love him to death. He's amazing. But he says some stuff that's kind of dumb sometimes. He's eight. But we're always treating him like, of course, he has great contributions to make to the world, and he gets treated that way in school. Another young man wrote, and this is a common, I mean, every inside-out teacher that I've ever spoken to, including Hillary Binda, reports getting this evaluation at some point. For two hours a week, I felt like I wasn't in prison. None of these things, right, not changing our employment policies, not starting to teach classes to students who are incarcerated, not starting to teach inside-out students, none of these things by themselves right, is going to remove the stain of mass incarceration from American society. But collectively, together, if we all commit ourselves in that direction, they will. And let me, I want to close with this thought. It goes back to a conversation that I had with my dad before he passed away, a few years before he passed away. We went to see if we, we saw a movie. And it was about the civil rights movement. And of course, I wanted to ask, it, it passed our test of African American characters. I wanted to ask him, what did he think of it, you know, from his own perspective? And he said, that he, he liked it. He was glad the history was being told. But he said there was one thing that I didn't like about it. And this is something I want you all to think about as you confront a problem that is, seems as overwhelming as mass incarceration or mass punishment or hyper-incarceration does today. He said, the thing I didn't like about the film is they made it look like everybody was in the civil rights movement. And he was like, yeah, but well, that wasn't true at all. He said, we were unpopular. Even people who agreed with our goals of fighting segregation said, well, y'all choosing the wrong tactics. You know, this civil disobedience that everybody raises up today is like 
some pr- you know proud tradition, and they, and they and they hold up the civil rights fighters and the civil rights workers, and they tell people today, well, why can't you all be like that? Well, they were telling them then that their tactics were wrong and setting back the cause and they shouldn't be breaking the law and they shouldn't be blocking bridges and they shouldn't be getting arrested and they shouldn't be dropping out of school to join the movement. They shouldn't be sitting in and lunch counters. So my dad said, this is the thing. I mean, he, Martin Luther King, the greatest civil rights hero in American history, You won't go to school on his holiday. 1966 Gallup poll. Favorable, unfavorable? Two-thirds of Americans had an unfavorable view of Martin Luther King in 1966. So this is my dad said, listen, here's the thing. When you are facing a profound and apparently immovable obstacle and injustice, people will tell you, that change is impossible. And then you march, and then you ad- agitate, and then you start tuppet, and then you go behind prison walls and get educated and break down bonds and learn that what connects you to somebody who's in a prison cell is much, much deeper and more profound than what divides you. You join Arthur Benbury and his partakers, College Behind Bars mentoring program. And you do all of that, and you create the change. And then the same people that told you that the change was impossible turn around and say, oh, that that was inevitable. We knew that was going to happen. And they make a movie about it. So I don't know, I don't know, right? SNCC got started because a group of people went and joined together 1960 and said, we got to do something about this problem that nobody else was talking about. I don't know what is going to be the action. I don't know what's going to be the idea. I don't know what's going to be the movement. I don't know what's going to be the innovation. I don't know who's going to be the collective among this generation of tough students and students across America that is going to lead us to defeat mass incarceration the way a previous generation defeated Jim Crow and a previous generation defeated slavery. But I know that you're going to do it. And when you do, they're going to make a movie about you. And I'll buy the popcorn. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Okay. Hold on for one second. Will the inside students be able to hear these questions? Yeah, if you can, can you, if you, I, I'm mic'd, so you can stand next to me and then everybody will be able to hear. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. Um, see you in class next week. Um, so my question actually had to do, so I'm part of the Inside Out class, I tutored a PhD degree, and I've been through a bunch of trainings um, yeah. through some of the facilities. And one of the things they, they talk about a lot in the facilities is PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And when I was at my last training, um, not for our class, but for a different facility, it, they talked, I asked them if people who were, uh, they were conducting investigations under PREA who had uh, been assaulted or different aspects, if they had the option not to go through with the investigation, like what role this person had in the investigation, and they said that they didn't. And so my question kind of has this overarching question as to what is the role of justice in the organization, because they said, no, we have to do it as part of the organization instead of doing, like looking, working with the person who has been uh, the victim of some sort of action. So I was wondering how you think, because they have a whole system of like things that go along with PREA, 
how you think they people Sorry, who's they? Who like the they? the facilities and the complex and the prison system. Got it. How people who are incarcerated and then are need to avail themselves of the system that is incarcerating them because there's this kind of complex relationship between the two. I just wanted to know like how you see justice working in that and if because the justice that is pursued often is for the organization. The organization meaning the prison uh, system. Yes. So you're saying how do people who are incarcerated get justice from the system that is incarcerating them? Yes. It's very hard. Uh, it's very hard. And that's one of the, so let me just put this water down and put this mic back on. One of, I think it requires a combination of probably three things. It requires an administration, a corrections administration that is farsighted and understands that the Department of Corrections has an obligation to ensure the safety of all of the men and women who are incarcerated and understands that that obligation does not include to defend people who are officers of the state that have committed wrong. That's the first thing. The second thing that you have to have is you have to have often outside forces putting pressure. People have to have, to have access to lawyers. They have, ac have to have access to prison libraries to understand what their rights are. I mean, you just, re you just referenced uh, PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, but that has a series, that's a law, right? And so if you don't have a law library in your prison and you're incarcerated, then you don't have any ability to understand the details of that law. You also need to be able to have access to court cases and court decisions so that you can understand how that law has been interpreted. You have to have access to agency materials so you can see how it's been implemented by federal agencies. So you have to have access to information from the outside. And then the third thing that you have to have is you have to have among incarcerated people who are seeking to pursue some sort of justice within that system you have to be unbelievably tenacious and persistent. You have to be almost superhuman in your willingness to incur um, kind of hostility from those who are in charge of you and who can control you and who can harm you. And so the combination of things that needs to be put in, that needs to exist is almost, almost never does exist, which is why you see so much rampant injustice in those settings. I think that this is to me one of the roles that kind of outsiders play. Any uh, institution of a prison is, if it's unwilling to allow outsiders in, then something is going wrong. Because what, what do you have to hide? What are you afraid of? I mean, I would say this about other institutions as well. Schools, you know, if you're not allowing people inside, what are you hiding? And so I think that although it's not the direct mission of education behind bars, right, it's not the di direct mission of uh, the Tufts program, that one side benefit of you going in as an inside out students and one side benefit of professors that are going in who are teaching even if there are no outside students involved is that you're breaking down these closed institutions and you're bringing in sunlight. Um, and in my opinion, in any institution, there are good people. There are good people in the Department of Corrections there are good officers, there are good guards, there are people who actually want, would welcome the system, this, the, the institution they're in to become, to become safer. Sometimes they don't know how to speak up. They don't know how to speak out. They're afraid too, sometimes, of retaliation. You talk, you know, they talk all the time about, you know, the no snitch culture. 
The notion, there's nowhere stronger than the Nosenich culture than among you know, police, law enforcement and, and Department of Corrections. So when outsiders come in, they can break some of that up. They can let people know that their work is being watched. And, I, and, and you know, I, you know they, I mean, this is, and you shouldn't have anything to be afraid of. I talk to people come, the registrar and at the law school, they're always asking, like, sending out these emails, trying to get permission, you know, permission to let people come to your class. And I mean, it, inside out class is different because of the particulars of that. But otherwise, I'm always telling the university, like, my class is open. Like, there's no, there's no permission. Like, if, I'm, if I need to grant you permission in my seminar room or my lecture hall, then we, we have a problem. So, you know, I, you know, it's a little bit what's good, good for the goose, good for the gander. I'm saying I apply this to myself as well. No? The black shirt? You look like you were raising your hand. No? Oh. Yeah, I pointed at you and then you turned around. <laughs> Can you come up? You did have your hand up, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Siri. Um, and my question was you talked a little bit about Dennis Clark's constraints on his imagination yeah. um, and all the rhetoric of um, the hero, was it the heroin epidemic? Yeah, time? yep. Um, and how like therefore he jumped to the conclusion of reaching out to law enforcement um, for this issue. Um, and I'm just wondering, there's so, ma there's so much rhetoric going on about um, mass incarceration today um, and like being afraid of people that are incarcerated um, in this narrative and how can we kind of allow our imagination not to be boxed in in that way? Right. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Um, thank you. You can stand up here if you want, but you shouldn't feel pressured to. <laughs> I think, I mean, I do, I, I do think that that is one of the great values of, of a program like an inside out program or a prison initiative behind bars more generally because it brings a set of voices into a conversation that have been boxed out and been excluded. And I don't think there's anything more, to me there's nothing more mind expanding than going into a facility where you've been told you're supposed to be afraid to be a go that's set off in miles and miles and miles away behind these incredibly high walls and these barbed wire. And you go through nine security checkpoints and, you know, the whole theater of it to convey the depravity of the people who are inside, right? And that's all consistent with every message that we've ever received. And then you sit down in a seminar room. And you have a conversation. And it turns out that you're talking to somebody who has the same number of siblings as you have. And likes some of the same music that you do. And like some of the same books as you like and want some of the same things for their child that you imagine you will want for your child when you have a child one day or that you can remember your parents wanting for you. And then you start to get engaged in an intellectual discourse and all kinds of things can get flipped. I mean, not, we have conversations all the time because my stuff is about the legal system where some of the students that are incarcerated Sometimes they want longer sentences in some of our fact patterns than, some of the, than, the college, than the university students. And I don't even care about the, the details of that aren't what's important. What's important is how that flips and reverses every stereotype and assumption that anybody has. Oh, you know, 
I go into prison. Everyone's going to say they're innocent. Nobody that's ever spent any time in prisons knows that that's not true. And I go into prison, everybody's going to want to uh, tear down the prison walls. Not true. And so you have these experiences, and you know, there's nothing like having your assumptions overturned in one direction that then makes you question another assumption, right, that you might have had. So to me, that's, you know, the best way for us to expand our imaginations. And then that's like a process way. And then sort of content, you know, I think we should all collectively, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but we should all put our heads together. Oh, I like that ringtone, man. No, that's, that's, that's mellow. That's good. <laughs> to collectively try to imagine a world without prisons. To put that forward and then to try to say, well, what would it take as a society to achieve that? Like, what would we have to do? What would we have to change? What structures would we have to put in place? What alternatives to dispute resolution would we have to create? What violence and prevention programs would we have to endorse? What economic reordering would we have to pursue? What social programs would we have to sustain to make that possible? Thank you.